What's up folks, welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi, I'm on camera today. Warhammer 40k has a lot of units, like an absolute butt ton. And not all of them can be great. So today I thought it would be fun to go through all of the worst units in 40k, the worst one for every single faction in the game. And here's the criteria by which I selected them. So first off, we're going to be looking at everything in the game, just like we did in the previous video, in the context of GT 2020 style lists. We're going to be ignoring fortifications. Those are easy picks for the worst types of units. Games Workshop really has it out for fortifications. They want to make them as difficult to play as possible for some reason. So generally, we're going to be looking for units that are either totally superseded within their faction or just don't have a role that they complete. There's nothing that they bring to the faction that's particularly unique or efficient. Just given the subject material, this is going to be pretty opinion based. Well, looking at the best units in each faction, we can look at some recent data to see which units are more widely played or see when it, which units are perform more effectively on the table. But because we don't quite have that for units that are unplayed or played very rarely, uh, it's difficult to look at this subject without it being pretty opinionated. So the selections of this video are probably going to be pretty arbitrary just because, you know, there's no way that we could sort of mathematically prove that these are the worst units. I might also be skipping some of the smaller sub factions in the game. I talked about as many sub factions as I could in the best units video, but because this one's a little bit more difficult to quantify, I'm not going to be talking about unaligned models. I'm not going to be talking about other weirder factions like that. Just because of the subject material, this video took a lot to complete, so I'd really appreciate it if you could drop a like on the video. Drop a subscribe if you enjoy this style of content that also lets me know that you like it, which is very helpful for both you and me, I think. But anyway, let's talk about the worst units in 40k. Let's frickin' do it. So starting off, we'll go the same order that we did in the previous video and begin with our unallied Xenos races, these random Xenos that live in the corners of the galaxy and don't have any friends. And the number one in that category today are going to be the ancient and powerful Necrons. Now, a unit in the Necron Codex that is not ancient or powerful is going to be the Obelisk. Necrons have a lot of weirdly inefficient options in their codex. Things like Triarch Praetorians and Flayed Ones are just sort of strange and don't really have a place. But the one that takes the cake is this big idiot Lord of War choice. This thing just basically doesn't do anything. It has a weird rule that screws flying units but only not really like sometimes it deals them one mortal wound which doesn't really matter it can buff its guns when it remains stationary which is pretty cool but its guns aren't that exciting it has 16 strength seven shots that can go to two damage sometimes if it stands still which is already pretty tough because a lot of times it has a tough time fitting in deployment zones just because of the sheer size of the model. And its movement isn't that great. So not only does it have to be within 24 inches of you in order to shoot you at all, so 32 inches if it's not advancing just to hit you with its guns, but also then would need to stand still to actually deal any damage with those guns. Just terrible. And all of this for about 400 points is way too many for this piece of garbage. I don't know what was in people's minds when they came up with this thing. It's guns like should shoot 36 inches at least if it wants to do any damage. It has less range damage output than most Lords of War in the game and also restricts it to a very short range on a not particularly survivable platform given that it doesn't have an invulnerable save. Like just putting a couple las cannons into this thing will kill it. What a terrible model. Moving on to orcs. Now as is the case for a lot of these older way more bloated factions that have a bunch of extra models in them. Orcs have a lot of garbage in their codex. But the one that we're going to be talking about today are the Burna Boys. Now, I hadn't actually looked at this data sheet in a while, and in my head, these guys had Scorches, which is a pretty good profile to have. They're short-range heavy flamers, essentially. Shoot D6 times to strength 5, AP 1 for 1 damage, but only fire at 8 inches instead of 12. The downside is that Burna Boys don't have that. They have a way worse thing. 
Now, if there's one thing in the game that orcs don't have trouble killing, it's enemy light infantry. Turns out anything with like T3 and a 5-up save is just going to get buried under the weight of attacks of a bunch of orc boys attacking them. And that's not something the faction typically has trouble with. So why would you would pay extra on a regular orc boy to give them a terrible gun that does something that they're already better at doing in melee doesn't make any sense, especially since this gun is so bad. Compared to any normal flamer, the burnout absolutely pales in comparison only shooting d3 times at 8 inch range instead of 12 what a garbage piece of war gear not to mention the fact that with that only 8 inch range a burn -a boy unit is basically already gonna have to be at the point where they could just charge and get into melee in order to attack with their terrible gun and typically attacking infantry with this gun means your opponent's going to pull themselves out of charge range if you inflict any casualties whatsoever. So you're just making your army worse at fighting when you attack with these guys. For the 11 points that you'd spend on a burn -a boy with this awful gun, you could just take a regular orc boy who has more attacks and is going to engage at that same range. Not to mention the fact that they have objective secured, also have a gun if you need to shoot something and at longer range. There's just so many upsides to having a regular orc over this garbage elite slot. Moving on to the Tau Empire, we have, I think, a pretty spicy pick for the worst unit in the Codex. Tau have a lot of less seen options, especially in their auxiliary units like Kroot, Crutox, Vespids, but all of those fill a role in the faction, even if they're a little inefficient at doing it. I mentioned one of the criteria for units in this video were units that were totally superseded by other options, and this is certainly the case for the Tau Empire, whose tactical drone units cost twice as much as just bringing a drone alongside your battlesuits. That's right! A unit of tactical drones has an additional tax on it for taking drones independently of battlesuits for no reason. There is basically no reason you would ever take a tactical drone unit, especially since the only reason to take drones is to save your protocol for your battlesuits, which means you already have battlesuits in your list to take the cheaper drone version. There's no reason that these guys cost 10 extra points for a gun drone out of these tactical drone units than they would accompanying a crisis suit or a commander or a broadside or any of these other battlesuit variants. It's ridiculous and terrible and makes it the worst unit in the codex. With that, let's move on to the forces of the hive mind. Start off with Gene Stealer Cults. This one was a little bit interesting. I really wanted to pick pure strain Gene Stealers in this slot, which are just regular Gene Stealers, but cost more and are in the elite slot, as well as not having the support network of buffs that standard Tyranids have that make their Gene Stealers pretty good. Pure strain Gene Stealers are, are just miserable, but the one I picked for today was the Biophagus. This guy is a 40 point elite slot character whose sole purpose in life is to buff Aberrants, a unit that is already far over costed and not particularly effective compared to the other options in the codex. And the way the Biophagus does it is not very good. He rolls a D3 to give them a random buff. You don't even get to pick the buff that you give them. They can only be affected once per game. And there's a 1 in 6 chance that he kills a 30 or 40 point model out of that expensive unit for your trouble. He can help himself a little bit with his familiar to massage the buff that he's giving the unit. But that costs an additional 15 points. Just terrible. Throw this guy out. You're already not taking Aberrant, so why would you take the character that buffs Aberrants really badly? With that, let's move on to Tyranids. This is actually a little bit of a tough one, mostly because I love Tyranids, and I can see uses for almost everything in the Codex, except for the unit that we're picking here, which is the Hive Crone. These Tyranid Flyer battlefield rules are just awful. <laughs> Compared to almost any other flyer in the game, they are really bad. And that's saying something because Warhammer 40k has some terrible flyer models in it. But coming in at a whopping 155 points, this thing has a wildly below average defensive profile. Only toughness 6, only a 4 plus armor save, meaning almost everything punches directly through that save. It's also not a true flyer, lacking the airborne rules. So it's just a 30-inch move 
model with fly. Fortunately, it doesn't actually have the aircraft keyword, so it doesn't have all of the downsides coming with that keyword, like not being able to hold objectives. But that's a small mercy when you look at the absolute abysmal damage output that you get for your 155 points. It brings one stinger salvo, a pretty bad flamer that only shoots eight inches, as well as like a weird missile launcher equivalent that I, I guess has a haywire effect on it. All right. Haywire is typically reserved for units that can make a large volume of shots like Skyweavers. So you can actually have the weight of dice to get those mortal wounds out. But only shooting four shots, I guess somebody thought would be fine. That's all packed up in only a four plus weapon skill and ballistic skill with no way to innately buff its own hit rolls. Meaning you're spending 155 points for a, a model that doesn't attack many times and the attacks it have are wildly inaccurate. I could maybe forgive this thing if it had hard to hit, but no, it doesn't. There's no defensive mechanics in this thing. It's just a, a piece of trash. So with that, we can move on to the ancient kingdoms of the Eldari and start with the craft worlds, the Azuriani, as it were. Now, I think the low-hanging fruit in this faction are Fire Dragons and their Phoenix Lord. But to be perfectly honest, 23 points per model for a Fire Dragon for a melta gun on the whole is not hyper inefficient. And while melta guns are not a great profile and there's so many way better options in the faction, I mean, Fire Dragons are terrible. They are, they are just bad. But I don't know if they're the worst unit ever, considering you can put a reasonable number of melta gun shots out for not super expensive. That said, one model that doesn't put out anything equivalent to a Melta Gun is Amalyn Shadow Guide, the Ranger character. For 55 points in the Elite slot, you get a character with a 2 plus ballistic skill, pretty good, a Camellia Line Cloak, the ability to Deep Strike, a 4 plus invulnerable save, and the ability to walk directly through walls, all of which is pretty cool. The downside is that, that that's it. There's nothing else going on here. She has a single Ranger Long Rifle as her damage output, which means that there's nothing behind that character keyword or that invulnerable save. You're not actually protecting anything because this model doesn't do any damage. Being a character means that you can't exactly use her to drop in and grab secondary objectives because she just gives up assassinate as soon as she appears anywhere. She also can't deploy scramblers because she has that character keyword. She's just essentially a pointless include for 55 points, which remember is only 10 points less than a full unit of regular <laughs> rangers. You could just have five long rifle shots and objectives secured with most of these special abilities for 10 more points than you could have this this character who doesn't do anything to buff any other unit in the codex. I hope Amelyn can shadow guide herself right out of the window because we will be throwing her out. Moving on to Drukari. This is a tough one because Drukari have a lot of really good profiles and even the worst things in the Drukari codex. And this is more or less the case for our pick today, which is going to be the Razor Wing Jet Fighter. Well, compared to a lot of the other flyers in the game, the Razorwing Jet Fighter doesn't look too bad. Comparatively to the rest of the Drukari faction, this thing is woefully inefficient. Bringing two Dark Lances, a weirdly inappropriately statted missile launcher that just has the, the strangest profiles ever, with a decent two flat damage blast profile that has no AP, meaning a lot of the two wound models you're going to be shooting into, like Space Marines, will just shrug off all of its attacks, or a, a negative two AP missile that only deals one damage, meaning that it's only going to scratch the paint on anything that you actually want to use that AP on. Definitely don't forget that twin splinter rifle, though, because if there's anything that says air superiority fighter to me, it's poisoned anti-infantry small arms attached to your airplane. What? At least having two Dark Lances for 160 points isn't too bad, but considering you can have one Dark Lance for 85 points and one of the hundreds of raiders you're including in your army, that's not worth the cost at all. Moving on to Harlequins, this is probably the easiest pick in this entire video. It's going to be the Void Weaver. Now, as soon as I mention the Void Weaver to a lot of people, they say, the what now? I've never seen that model on the table. And there's a good reason for that. A Void Weaver is a Star Weaver variant that comes in at the heavy support slot for 90 points and trades its ability to carry any troops, any of the really powerful Harlequin infantry that you can put inside a Star Weaver for a really <laughs> terrible ranged attack. It can mount either a single Haywire Cannon, that's right, one of the guns that an entire unit of Star Weavers could take, or this terrible prismatic cannon that can shoot one strength eight AP4 D6 damage shot. For 90 points, you get the equivalent of a single Melta gun, but not even as good as a Melta gun. It doesn't do that much damage. 
Moving on to Chaos Demons. This was a really tough one because like Orcs, Chaos Demons are an old and bloated model line that has a lot of profiles, many of which are very terrible. I really wanted to put the Soul Grinder in here because it's a Defiler profile in Demons, which means it doesn't have access to Demon Forge, which is the reason that the Defiler profile itself is already nerfed. So it comes in with a 4 plus weapon skill, ballistic skill, but with no way to buff itself, essentially. But on recommendation of some community members, I elected to pick the Fate Skimmer for this one. A Flux Master is a Zinchian HQ choice that comes on a disc of Zinch and can cast one Psychic Power. Pretty good, but for 105 points, it's a little bit expensive. The Fate Skimmer is a Flux Master mounted on a chariot, meaning it gets four additional wounds and two additional inches of movement, as well as a couple extra mediocre melee attacks it can use with its four plus weapon skill for 55 additional points. You're already taking one of the least efficient options of the codex and just making it less efficient. I don't have much else to say about the fade skimmer. It's it's just garbage. And not only is it garbage, but it's also taking up an HQ slot in demons, where demons tend to have some of their most powerful options. It's a good thing that this thing can fly, not only to circumvent some of the downsides of the chariot keyword, one of the worst unit keywords in the game, but also so that it can fly directly out of your lists. Moving on to Chaos Space Marines, I actually racked my brain on this one for a while because Chaos Space Marines, while they have a lot of profiles, they also have a lot of mediocre profiles that, while they're not good, don't tend to be particularly bad. That was until I remembered that the Mutilators exist. Whoever decided that this combination of profiles is a good idea is an idiot. You know what we should put on our powerful melee-only beatstick models? A four inch movement, a, a, a movement value that will not allow them to get to grips with any models basically ever outside teleporting and putting a bunch of charge buffs on them. Charge buffs that, it should be mentioned, are going to be much better used on a regular unit of Chaos Terminators, who, while a little bit less efficient points per wound, also can take a gun, which is a pretty cool thing to have. The Flesh Metal Weapons ability, just like the Obliterators have, is an interesting one, and while it works well for Obliterators since you have a lot of target selection on that unit, meaning, for example, if you roll only one damage on an Obliterator shot, you can just turn those guns on something that you don't need multi-damage to kill. A melee weapon, however, has no such ability. Once you've charged, you're already engaged with the thing that you're fighting, which means that even if you manage to deliver mutilators to their target, you could be punching a big tank and roll only one damage on the flesh metal weapons, meaning you're not gonna do much there. Sorry, buddy. At least a unit of Terminators with Lightning Claws has a consistent profile and can always reroll those wounds if you're punching something with high toughness, rather than just hoping for a big strength roll on your Flesh Metal Weapons ability. This unit is one of the most poorly considered concepts for a unit mechanically in the game. I, I don't know how you would fix them besides just making their weapons significantly better or giving them a bunch of buffs to charge or something. Moving on to Death Guard, this is another tough one because Death Guard have a lot of really good profiles, and I almost picked one of the weird Fetid Virian characters, one of those random sort of expensive characters that fill the Elite slot that you never really want to take, but those all at least provide interesting buffs that you can sometimes build an army around. One unit that doesn't is the Death Guard Cultist. Now, Cultists in and of themselves are not a terrible profile, especially since the Death Guard variety actually are five points instead of being six like the regular Chaos Space Marine version. A big part of that is their Plague Followers keyword, which means that you can't spam them more units than you have Bubonic Astartes units in your army, which I think is a nice include. But is there ever reason you would take this Chaos Cultist over a Poxwalker, who for the same cost and despite being slower, is also harder to kill and fearless, meaning you're never in danger of randomly losing your backline objective holders to a particularly bad combat attrition roll, especially given the fact that that speed is not often too big of an issue, given that the units are going to be standing in the back of your table, performing action, screening out your backline, or just obsecking your objectives to prevent your opponent from stealing them. And you can sort of supersede that low movement value with Poxwalkers just by regenerating models in the unit to give them a little bit of a bump. Death Guard Cultists have none of those abilities, and while they do pack a, a really terrible shooting profile, I don't think that is really worth giving up the upsides of taking additional Poxwalkers, given how powerful that unit is. Moving on to Thousand Suns, I have elected to pick for this faction the Mutilith Vortex Beast. This thing... It's actually not that bad. It's an interesting concept for a profile, just executed poorly in my opinion. 
the Vortex Beast can generate kind of the equivalent of psychic powers during your shooting phase, either rolling for two of them on a chart or just picking the effect that it wants, but then has to make a Vortex Power roll, usually of a 2+, plus or 3+, plus, in order to actually get that power off. Generally speaking, it can just perform kind of a smite equivalent every turn, which is fine, but definitely not worth 135 points, especially if for a unit that's not particularly fast, doesn't hit very hard in melee, only with a couple strength seven attack with a four plus weapon skill that has no way to improve its accuracy. And once it's low on wounds, can begin killing itself with its own warp vortex ability. It's unfortunate for the vortex beast because I actually think it's it's pretty cool and definitely on the cusp of playability especially for a unit that has a pretty good points to wound ratio but unfortunately generating additional smites in a faction predicated entirely on being one of the best at generating smites doesn't really do much for you with that we'll begin to move away from the chaos factions let's talk about imperial and chaos knights together because i'm going to make just one pick for this one and that is the knight gallant or, as it's known in the Chaos Knights Codex, a Despoiler with Reaper, Chainsword, and Thunder Strike Gauntlet, I think. When you're spending 400 points on a unit, you really want it to be like doing something for the entirety of the game. Fortunately, knights typically do that by bringing some incredibly powerful shooting backed up by decent melee, or focusing entirely on shooting and being an incredibly powerful Alpha Strike threat. The Knight Gallant! doesn't do that. It just punches good. And unfortunately runs into the issue that bringing two separate close combat weapons almost never has any functionality in 40k. It gives you more flexibility on the profiles that you can pick, but it doesn't actually deal any additional damage, meaning you're just giving up the ability to shoot good for more flexibility in the fight phase, which essentially cuts your damage output throughout the course of the game in half, which is unacceptable for a 400 point unit. In my opinion, the death knell for this unit is that even in the slot of melee-focused knight profiles, it's eclipsed by some of the other options in the faction. A Serastus Knight Lancer, for example, is significantly faster, has an 8-flat damage melee attack, and is more difficult to kill with additional wounds and a better invulnerable save. For just a couple more points, there's just not much going for the Knight Gallant, unfortunately. Now with that, let's move on to Imperium proper and begin by talking about the Adepta Sororitas. In this slot, I picked the Dialogus, a character with no discernible role in the Adepta Sororitas army. She does provide plus one leadership to Sororitas units within six inches, but given that Sororitas are a faction that tends to rely on five model units that aren't really affected by morale, that's not a really big deal. She also has a five plus damage ignore for mortal wounds in the psychic phase, but only for herself, not for other sisters, meaning that that's basically just flavor text on this data sheet and doesn't really help protect a three wound model. But the big ability is that she can increase or decrease the value of miracle dice used within six inches of her. Now, most of the time, Sisters List are playing the Triumph from St. Catherine for this ability and all of the other things that the Triumph brings to the table, meaning that the Dialogus isn't really doing much since she isn't cumulative with that effect. At this stage, most Sisters Lists are also packing enough Miracle Die manipulation that they'll often be getting the results they want despite the fact that the Dialogus is there. And given the fact that you can't modify your Miracle Dice beyond a maximum of six and typically have enough sixes to use throughout the course of the game, this model isn't really doing anything. It is just giving up an assassinate point to your opponent though, so that's nice, I guess. Moving on to Custodes, I've picked the Custodian Wardens. What if I told you you could take a Custodian Guard Squad that cost 15 additional points, did not fill any troops requirement for any of your detachments, and on the whole was easier to kill? You probably wouldn't take that, which is why you shouldn't take Wardens. They do have a cool axe, so that's cool, I guess. But generally speaking, your foot custodians are going to be babysitting your objectives, meaning equipping them with a storm shield is probably the way to go, and you didn't want to take that axe anyway. Not to mention the fact that wardens don't actually deal that much damage. They get plus one attack and a couple extra points of strength for that 15 points you're spending on them, but that's it. Pretty bad in an army that's already struggling to find points thanks to bringing 40-plus point infantry in all of their other slots. Moving on to the Adeptus Mechanicus, we have... The Transvector! 
While I constantly extol the virtues of the other varieties of Deptus Mechanicus Flyer, this thing is just taking up your Flyer Battlefield roll slots in order to bring you a bad dedicated transport. While the Transvector itself might not be the worst profile ever, it is competing directly with some of the best units in 40k, those being the Fusilov and the Stratoraptor, while dealing significantly less damage and also not being a model that you really want to have as your dedicated transport. Well, they can deploy Skatarii, Vanguards, or Rust Stalkers, or something like that to areas all the way around the table. One of the strengths of having transport mechanics in 40k is that you're able to hold or contest an objective with them and force your opponent to kill that unit twice in order to control that objective. Unfortunately, this doesn't quite work for an aircraft model because your opponent doesn't actually have to kill that model to grab the objective back from you, given that aircraft keyworded models cannot hold or contest objectives, meaning that the most useful part of having that transport capacity is totally worthless on this thing. For just 20 more points and the same slot, just take a Fusilov and kill hundreds of points of your opponent's models every turn. Moving on to Astra Militarum, I really wanted to pick Ogrens in this slot for just how hilariously outclassed they are by their Bulgrin cousins, but I couldn't overlook this one little Forge World option, the Trojan Support Vehicle. Trojan this thing used to be a staple in 8th edition every time you took a super heavy Astra Militarum vehicle because they could give those vehicles plus one to hit, which made them absolutely invaluable in many Astra Militarum archetypes. Unfortunately, in 9th edition, they repair one damage. For 85 points, you get a model with a heavy bolter. That's it, with a 4-plus ballistic skill that quickly degrades. Not to mention the fact that this thing is a vehicle, meaning it's giving up Bring It Down points when it dies, and it loses its 10 wounds. It does have the cool ability to replenish models' single-fire weapons, so things like hunter-killer missiles or even manticore missiles can be replaced by the Trojan Support Vehicle, but, but only on vehicles and only one of them per turn. Given that 40k only lasts 5 rounds now, and a lot of times your frontline vehicles are going to be dying over the course of that, you often don't have a chance to use this ability. Not to mention the fact that this thing costs two-thirds the amount of another Manticore. For just a couple more points, you could just bring another Manticore instead of this Trojan support vehicle. While a lot of units might be superseded by other units, this thing just doesn't really have a purpose. Maybe if it repaired more damage or had a more interesting support effect, you could see it on the table, but there's just never a reason to take this guy. One of the toughest selections in this video was Grey Knights, a faction that already doesn't have that many options, and the options that it has all more or less fill a role in the faction. One thing that doesn't, though, is the regular Dreadnought. Generally speaking, Dreadnoughts in a Grey Knights list fulfill a backline fire support role. Whether they're going to be casting Astraleum on themselves and shooting through walls to hit your opponent's objective secured units or dedicated transports that are hiding behind stuff. And if you're doing that, you're going to take a Venerable Dreadnought because for just 15 more points, it gets plus one to hit all the time. Whereas the standard Dreadnought is saddled with a three plus weapon skill. That doesn't mean that the standard Dreadnought can't fulfill that role, given that it just also does the same thing. It just does it strictly worse than a Venerable Dreadnought. So in a faction where you're already lacking consistency, there's almost never a situation where you would give up the ability to get that 2 plus Ballistic skill. Not to say that Dreadnoughts are particularly bad. This one is just worse than the other option in the same slot in the same codex. Moving on to Inquisition. Inquisition actually have a lot of data sheets that, while they might look not very good on the surface, are actually all pretty solid. Things like Jakara Weaponsmiths are single model units that are also characters, meaning they're often untargetable, and can like shoot laser cannons at people. And Acolytes can bring free plasma guns to the table to rip aliens apart with that Ordo Xenos ability. One thing that doesn't really have a role in the faction though is the Demon Host. Well, I'm not sure that the Demon Host is bad per se. It is a infantry character that has to get up close and personal with its opponent's army in order to, to deal any damage. And that just means that you're often going to be giving up an assassinate point as soon as this thing commits. And it doesn't really do any damage. It has a one-shot strength eight gun that sometimes deals three damage and a couple of attacks that are not very solid. That said, it is only 25 points, but given the other data sheets in this faction, I don't think there's really ever any reason to take it. Officio Assassinorum was an easy one. While all four of the assassin profiles have situations in which they're very powerful, one of the reasons that the faction's so good, because you can switch them in and out depending on what you're playing against, the Vindicare Assassin is often the one that accomplishes nothing throughout the course of the game. While you would hope for 100 points, you would take this thing and be able to kill one of your opponent's characters, in practice, that's not 
really how it ends up working. Having a single high impact shot weapon means that oftentimes the Vindicare Assassin can just be screwed by dice, either missing his attack or failing to wound. Sometimes you reroll the one into a one and your 100 point Assassin character is doing absolutely nothing that game. Or he just rolls bad on his consecutive headshot rolls and can't deal enough mortal wounds to kill his target. He's only dealing D3 damage with the initial shot, meaning that he's hoping to deal a bunch of damage with that headshot ability. But if he flubs any of those headshot rolls, which is pretty likely, he's probably not going to kill them and they have a chance to run away and hide out of line of sight. There is the stratagem to fire twice at the Vidicare Assassin, but unfortunately, you can't shoot the same target more than once, meaning that if he does end up getting screwed by dice on that initial shot, he won't get another chance to kill that character before he gets the opportunity to move out. You basically have to be comboing this guy with other snipers in order to make killing characters at all reliable. And even then, characters with a large wound pool are going to be difficult for this guy to chew through, especially given that the rifle shot initially only deals a D3. If he could shoot somebody for flat three and then inflict headshot damage on top of people, I think it would be okay. But unfortunately, that random damage value just makes him a little bit less consistent than people expect. Moving on to Star Striders, I liked talking about them in the previous video, and especially talking about Nietzsche's squad, which is, I think, one of the most interesting profiles in the game. And one of the units that I think is one of the least interesting profiles in the game is their attendant tech priest, Larson Vandergraus. This guy for 25 points and an elite slot gets you, I don't, I don't know. I don't think he's, he's not, he's not really doing anything. He has a kind of weird Tesla pistol, but only a ballistic skill of four. And he does give Ellie City and Star Strider units a five plus invulnerable save, but only when they're wholly within six inches of them, meaning every part of every base in the unit has to be completely within that six inch bubble, meaning it's actually very small. Given that the faction is made up entirely of characters and one tiny unit of guys, that's not a really big deal, but it is kind of an annoying hurdle to jump through to only get a five plus invulnerable save on units that are probably not surviving anyway. We talked about Demon Host probably not being worth 25 points, and given that this guy does way less damage, I, this guy is certainly not worth that at all. Moving on to Sisters of Silence, I talked about in the last video Prosecutors being a pretty okay option for Adeptus Cassodi's list, looking to add some bodies to their list to perform actions or stay on objectives, but without having to pay the 40 plus points you do for a regular Custodes. The flip side of that coin are the Vigilators, who pay an additional 5 points over a Prosecutor for no better stat line, and for the opportunity to trade their bolt gun out for an Executioner Great Blade, a pretty decent melee weapon strapped to a not very good melee profile. Three plus weapon skill is fine, and it does get to a reasonable strength of five for AP3 with D3 damage, but only two attacks a model, meaning you're spending 17 points on a unit that's basically gonna deal less damage than every other dedicated melee unit in the game. Given that the point of these units is to add some additional bodies to an Adeptus Custodes list, paying extra points for those bodies and losing your ranged attack seems totally pointless to me. That's a little bit different for Witch Seekers, who at the very least for that additional cost bring a flamethrower. These models being tied up entirely in melee with a not very good melee profile basically puts them in the dirt. And with that, we can move on to our very favorite boys, the Space Marines. And do Space Marines have so many profiles to go through? Like, it's actually insane. Between all of the chapters of Space Marines, there is a lot of garbage. I talked about scouts in a recent video and how not very good they are competing directly with Phobos infantry in the troop slot while being elites themselves. I think Reavers also sort of have this problem, but there are situations in which I would play either scouts or Reavers. But there's one unit above all I think takes the cake and actually is the subject of one of the most viewed videos on this channel, the Fire Strike Servo Turret. I talked for like 30 minutes in that video about why this model is garbage, but basically it straps a mediocre range profile to a ridiculously expensive and not all that survivable base that can be accessed more efficiently dozens of other places in the codex. Alternatively, you could put a very short range but powerful range attack on it, which sends its points cost absolutely through the roof and ties a short range weapon to a movement three unit. This thing is utter garbage and should never see play in any serious Space Marine list. Which is why I'm picking it for the worst unit in the faction. And that's it! We talked about basically every faction of 40k and the worst units. 
I had a lot of fun doing this video, so I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much for watching all the way to the end. If you have any terrible units that you think I missed in this video, go ahead, let me know down in the comments. I do want to hear everybody's stories about awful units. I think it's fun. <laughs> this is certainly a fun topic to talk about. And, and while it's a lot of times based on people's individual perspective, I don't think there's like really a true answer for the, for the worst units in 40K. But at least we can get started with a pretty concrete list. Anyway, thanks again for watching. Big thanks to my patrons over at patreon.com slash tactical tortoise also youtube channel members and twitch subscribers all those people help me make content and i really appreciate them and i appreciate you for watching all the way to the end remember to keep it classy folks and have happy wargaming